Well, good morning uh, once again, and again, welcome to Church Online at Faith Community Church. Uh, if you've been tracking with us over the last couple weeks, you know we've been doing a series called The Habits of Happiness. In fact, we've been uh, doing this for, I think, the last eight weeks. We probably have another two or three Sundays left to go. If you've missed any of the previous sermons, you can catch them all on our website. Uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can listen directly on the website and download it to your phone. And also, we have a YouTube channel that you'll find on our website where we just put all these uh, videos up for you to watch. Uh, so if you miss something and you want to catch up, go back, find them. They're all there. Uh, but we just have a couple of weeks left in this series before we begin moving on to something new. And I'm excited to uh, share some of that with you, but uh, not yet. But I'll give you some heads up in the next uh, week or two to follow about where we are moving next. But for now, we're continuing our series, The Habits of Happiness. And what we've been doing and what we're going to continue to do is we're looking at the one another statements found throughout the Bible and looking at how we can and really should be applying them in our lives, how we should be living out these statements, these one another statements. In fact, it's just a means of telling us how we should treat others. That's really the sum of it. But how we've been looking at it is that when we do these one another statements, when we incorporate them so deep into our lives that they become habits, and eventually they just become part of our character. When we do that, we are doing two things. The first is we are becoming happiness spreaders. We are passing along happiness to others. We are bringing happiness into the lives of others as we do these one another statements to them. Uh, the second thing that happens, and this is often not talked about, but it is important, and uh, it's not um, selfish to bring it up, uh, what happens is, as you bring happiness to other people, you also find it. So it's okay to want to bring happiness to people, and it's okay to want to find happiness in your own life. The really cool thing that the Bible teaches is, you can do both of those things at once. As you help other people be happy, you become happy. Uh, I haven't used this in a while, but one of the phrases I used in a few sermons was, doing good does good, not only to the people good is being done to, but also to the good doer. And so we're going to continue today looking at another one another statement. Uh, and this week's one another statement comes from Colossians 3 verse 16. It says this, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and, here it is, admonish one another with all wisdom. So I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, it's not a deep question. Again, it's never a trick question. Uh, and this is particularly for those watching live, but if you're watching this later, you can participate too. Uh, but if you are watching live, you're here with us this morning on Sunday, and I, I want you to actually write in the chat your response. And this is one of those question response things. I don't want you to overthink it. Just the first thing that comes to your mind. So are you ready? Here's the question. When you hear the word admonish, what do you think of? I'm going to give you a minute here and go and just write down something in the chat. Uh, write whatever you think of when you hear the word admonished. So I'll come back in just one minute. Just a quick search uh, gave this definition for admonish. It's a firm warning or a reprimand. That's pretty close to what I think of when I hear the word. I think of punishment. I think of strong correction. Uh, what I want to do this morning, though, is challenge some of the more typical or modern understandings of this word, of admonish and admonishment. And I'm going to do so first by beginning with a story. 
So there's this story in the New Testament, you might know it. It's found in John chapter 11. It's about a man named Lazarus. Now, Lazarus, he's the brother of Mary and Martha. We talked about them just a, a few weeks ago. And Lazarus, we're told, John 11, verse 1, it says this, Lazarus is sick. In fact, he was really sick. He was, in fact, we could say, dying. But I imagine, we have to read a bit between the details here, and I'm going to be paraphrasing through the story, so if you want to get the gist of it, uh, you can flip to John 11, or if you want the whole story, you can flip there and read it later. I'm going to just quickly walk us through this, but if you read a little bit between the lines, at least at the beginning, despite this severe illness, Mary and Martha, and perhaps Lazarus, I'm not sure, they, they might not have initially been too worried about it. You see, what, what makes their situation unique, what makes their uh, anxiety and fear not be present despite Lazarus dying, is Lazarus had a friend named Jesus. And so in verse 3, what you actually read is we're told that Lazarus is Jesus's dear friend. That's quite a description, actually, when you think about it. The Bible he describes Jesus's relationship with people in a number of ways. It talks about students and followers and family, even critics and worse than critics, enemies at points. But this description, it's quite unique. It's a dear friend. We are talking a deep, you know, down-to-earth, real close kinship, like brothers, friendship. And so just kind of put yourself in their shoes for a minute. So what would you do if you had a very close friend, a dear friend, who just happened to be the Son of God, the awaited Messiah, and you got really sick? You'd give them a call, I imagine, right? And so that's just what uh, the sisters of Lazarus did. They sent word to Jesus. But, and again, I'm jumping so far ahead through the story here. Again, if you want to read it, John 11. But here's what happens. Days go by. Lazarus gets worse and worse. And Jesus doesn't come. In fact, Jesus waits so long to show up that by the time he gets there, Lazarus has been dead for four days. So Martha, when she hears Jesus is finally in town, she, she runs up to the road to meet him. And she's grieving. Don't forget this, right? She is going through deep, terrible, emotional turmoil. She's in pain. And she says, Lord, Lord, if you had only come, my brother would still be alive. Essentially saying, why did you delay? What took you so long? Didn't you get the message in time? He, he was your dear friend, and now he's gone. Jesus responds with these words. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And his response here is actually a form of admonishment. See, it doesn't necessarily fit into the, the definition that we have in our modern usage of the word. It's not necessarily what you expect when you think of admonishment. If you're thinking of admonishment as punishment or reprimanding or harsh or strong correction. But here, this is where we need to begin to open our minds a little to a broader view of the word. Because... What the word literally means here is putting in mind. So to admonish is to put truth into someone's mind or their thoughts. Max Lucado, he, his definition of admonishment is, is this. Admonishment is high-octane encouragement. Kind of like that. There are times when people need to be reminded when people need to be regrounded by truth. But it needs to be done carefully and gracefully, like we talked about last week. There is a balance, grace and truth. You can't just beat people with truth. That's not going to help them. There has to be the balance of grace. People need to be reminded and regrounded by truth, but it needs to be done carefully, tactfully, and gracefully. That's what to admonish is, to carefully and gracefully put truth into one another's mind and thoughts. And you know, you've probably done this more than you think. 
Uh, go back to the story here. Remember Martha, she's distraught. Her brother has just died. She's still mourning. She's still in pain. She is uh, emotionally suffering. She's grieving. If you don't know what it's like to be in deep pain, to be in that type of emotional suffering, to have your entire life turned upside down, to be unraveled by emotional grief, and some of you might not know that yet, if you don't know that, then I'm willing to bet you'd probably know someone who has gone through that experience. Whether it's a coworker who has called you up and said their dad passed away and they don't know what they're going to do now. Your neighbor who is telling you about their new prognosis, uh, the illness is far worse than the doctors had hoped. Your friend who simply just asks you to sit with her as she stares down at the divorce papers freshly signed by her now ex-husband. Your sibling calls you up again. They're having trouble with your nephew. They feel like they have no more options left. The, the point I'm making, obviously, there's more scenarios than we can cover here. The point is, at some point, we are all invited into others' hurts. And often, it's not something that you volunteer for. You can, but a lot of the times, you are simply just brought into their situation. You didn't plan on discussing disease or divorce or death, but sometimes you're not even given a choice. So what do you do in those situations? You admonish. No, again, let's make sure we have the right understanding. I'm not saying you strongly reprimand or that you yell or get angry. I mean, you put truth into their mind. I've talked about this kind of concept, but it bears repeating here. Uh, our emotions are wonderful. They're tools that God has given us. They are so important. They help us to make sense of the world. But our emotions, if we allow them to run rampant, can spiral us very quickly out of control, and they need to be grounded by truth. And so when you're going through some deep emotional turmoil, and if you haven't yet, you will at some point in your life, I promise, you need to have trusted people who are able to speak truth back into your life to help ground you. That's what admonishment is. You need to have people who are going to admonish you because when you are going through emotional grief, I'm talking deep emotional distress, you are not thinking straight. You just aren't. That's not wrong. It's just what it is. And so you need to have people, and the Bible is a great source for this too, if you are in the frame of mind to open it and read it, but it helps to have people alongside you and to come and to, yes, admonish you, which means speaking truth into your life. That's what Jesus did here in our story, right? He, he reminded Martha, so remember she, she is going through deep emotional grief, and he reminded her of the truth about who he is. He says, he, I am the resurrection and the life. He's saying, I have power even over death itself, which of course we see by the end of the story. Here's the spoiler alert. Lazarus walks out of his own tomb. So let's take a minute to get practical here. Then how do we do it? How do you admonish well? Uh, first, you need to acknowledge that admonishment is not a replacement for meeting the actual physical needs of people, right? That's what James 2, uh, 14, 16 is all about. It says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you simply say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? Okay, so it's not relinquishing us from meeting the physical needs of others. Uh, admonishment is also not an opportunity to use the emotional vulnerability of someone to push an agenda. It's not about saying something shallow or pedestrian. In the face of emotional despair and deep pain, empty and meaningless words often do more harm than good. No, you see, admonishment is about offering high-octane encouragement. It is about speaking truth into the depths of despair. And if I have to speak truth into the depths of despair, the place I would start with then is the Word of God. 
the Bible is described uh, on multiple occasions as a sword. Uh, Ephesians 6 talks about it in the armor of God, but also in Hebrews 12. I want to read uh, some of that part from Hebrews 12. It says this, God's powerful word, the Bible, is sharp as a surgeon's scalpel, cutting through everything, whether doubt or defense, laying us open to listen and obey. Nothing and no one is impervious to God's word. We can't get away from it, no matter what. Okay, so what is it describing here? It's saying God's word is alive, it is active, it is truth, which is great, because that's what we are trying to do, is speak truth into despair and pain. It's not like a shotgun that gets fired with a widespread, hoping that something will hit the target. No, it's described as being as precise as the scalpel of a surgeon, and it's sharp enough to cut through anything, all layers of defense, all the doubts, and yes, even despair. In fact, if you went back to Isaiah, Isaiah 55 verse 11 says this, it says, it is the same with my word. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. Isn't that amazing? So God's word is truth. It is alive. It is sharp enough to cut through defenses and despair. It is precise, fulfilling exactly what it needs to, and it always achieves the purpose that God sends it with. So what might this actually look like? Uh, obviously, every situation is going to be uh, different and unique and will require special attention to the Spirit. If you're in one of those moments where someone is bringing you into their emotional pain and turmoil, and you want to admonish, you want to speak truth to them, start with a prayer. It can be a desperate prayer, too. I've had desperate prayers in those moments. It's like, dear God, I don't know what to say or do. Help me. Listen to the Spirit as He guides and leads you in your conversation. But, you know, the conversation could be as simple as saying something like this, like, I don't know exactly what you're going through. I can see how difficult it is for you. There's a Bible verse or a Bible story or whatever that helps me when I'm going through hard situations. Can I share it with you? I came across a, a quotation that's worthy of being shared here. It says this, those who are struggling don't need our opinions. They don't need our philosophies on suffering. They don't need someone to distract them with idle conversation about weather or politics. They need someone to admonish them with truth. And again, I know I've said this, this is my third or fourth or fifth time saying it already this morning, but uh, uh, I will say it again unapologetically because we need to redefine what it means to admonish, to understand the entire message this morning. When I say that we need to admonish those who are struggling, I don't mean a harsh word. I mean in a way that we've been talking about this morning. And let me go back to our, our theme verse, admonish one another, from Colossians 3. And I, I just want to go back and read a few verses that precede it. So I'm going to start at uh, verse 12. So Colossians 3.12, this is what it says. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Isn't that something? I want you to note the things, I'll do it for you, I suppose, that precede uh, admonishment. These are the things that you are supposed to do and have in your life before you go to admonish someone else. You ready? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, love. You are supposed to have peace from Christ, and the message of Christ is supposed to dwell in you. What's the message of Christ? Last week, uh, we summed up his ministry uh, like this. We said he came with love, he came with forgiveness, 
and he came with a dinner invitation. See, it's nothing like our, our current understanding of admonishment. It's not a harsh word. It's not yelling. It's not punishment. Biblical admonishment never comes from a place of superiority. It never comes from an attitude of putting others in their place. It comes from a deep sense of genuine care and love, wanting only what is best for the other person. And I'm not saying admonishment it comes only in the form of encouragement. It does come in many forms. It's not always affirmation or encouragement like we're mostly discussing this morning. It can come as discipline and correction, and that's not pleasant, but it's still done out of love and with grace. Whatever the form that the admonition comes in, the simple definition is always the same, which is admonishment is truth spoken into difficult circumstances. Admonishing is putting into someone's mind and thoughts truth. Those situations, if they come up in your life, they're hard. I don't know if you've experienced them, but it's hard. If it makes you feel any better, if there's camaraderie here, I can share with you that I find them really difficult when they come up. I feel like I'm drowning a little. I'm just uh, floundering. I don't know what to say. I don't know what is actually going to be helpful. I'm afraid that if I say something, it's going to not help at all. In fact, have a negative or adverse effect. But let me admonish you this morning and maybe myself as well. You can do this. Not because of some inherent gift you have of admonishment. Some of you might be really gifted in that. But we can all do this. Not because of anything we do. But because Christ within us. A few weeks ago, we described a few roles that we have as Christians. I want to bring them to mind uh, this morning. So one of the ones we looked at is you are an ambassador for Christ. So you have been commissioned, in a sense, to speak his truth to others. That's part of admonishment. You are a co-heir with Christ. So as a co-heir, you, you have the right to bestow the blessings of your inheritance to those you meet. And you are a child of God. Will you not speak up for your father? Will you not let them know about his deep love for them in the midst of their pain and sorrow and despair? And you know, I didn't forget that today's Father's Day. In fact, uh, I thought about it uh, as I was working through this one another statement, this, this uh, uh, command to admonish one another. And I, I realized that this is such an important thing for fathers to do, right? Breaking it back down to the simple definition, to speak truth into the lives of their children. It's a reminder that they are loved, that they are valued, and that they make their parents so proud. That goes a long way. In fact, I think it goes a lot further than uh, most men realize. And it, when you do that, what you're actually doing is pointing back to the love and the value and the pride that the Heavenly ha Father has for everyone. So let me just say then to our fathers watching, to our grandfathers, to the uncles, to the family friends, to all the men who have influenced any other uh, of the younger generation ever, let me first offer my thanks for all that you've done, for the love and care you show and give. But let me also admonish you. Make sure you're doing this. Make sure you are speaking truth into the lives of those around you. The words, or lack thereof, from a father have far more influence than you probably realize. So don't hesitate. Don't shrink back. Speak truth into the lives of those around you. That's what we're all to do. So that's your homework this week, not just to our fathers, but to everyone. If there's a moment for you to speak truth into uh, the lives of someone who are going through a tough time, or having emotional turmoil, they're going through despair, then I'm kind of encouraging you here to be a little more bold than perhaps you normally would be. It's not about being trite or just making something up or 
glossing over the difficulty of the situation, pretending it's not really that hard, they should kind of get over it, or, you know, smile, it gets better. That's not what it's about. But, but take that moment, really ask the Spirit to help guide you, give you something to share, and then speak truth into their life. Speak truth into despair. That's what admonishment is all about. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for all your love and care. We are grateful that your love uh, is full of grace and it accepts us where we are. It gives us room to grow, but that it's also full of truth and that you admonish us. You push and prod us to move beyond where we are. That you help us in our moments of deep pain and despair. You bring about the exact right word at the exact right moment. You bring the exact right person at the exact right moment. Lord, we thank you for those times and those circumstances. And we pray this week, Lord, and going forward, that if we can be that for someone else, that you would uh, lead and guide us, that you would prompt us, and that you'd give us the courage to take those next steps. We give you so much thanks and praise. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, something we do here every week at Faith Community Church uh, after the sermon is called Take Two. Let me throw it up on the screen. This is where we just take two minutes to answer two questions. The first is, what is one thing God is saying to you? I just want to take a moment to uh, think through the sermon, maybe some of the scriptures that were read. Maybe it's just a song that was sung or anything else that's happened this morning. But just ask, what is one thing God is saying to you? And then after you've heard that answer, I want you to go to the second question, which says, how is he asking you to respond? Now that you've heard from God, what does he want you to do with that? So I'm going to give you two minutes. I'll put the timer up, and then I will come back and close our service out. Thank you for coming this morning. Um, as always, the chat here will remain open for the next uh, 15 to 30 minutes, and uh, we would love for you to stick around and uh, just hang out, have some social time. Uh, maybe if you're feeling bold, you want to share what God is saying to you in your take two moments, and we can uh, discuss about that. We would just love for you to stick around and get to know us. And of course, if you're newer visiting and you want to get to know us more, you can find all about us on our website, as well as ways to contact us. The website's www.woodstockfcc.com, www.woodstockfccfaithcommunitychurch.com. 
And if you are a part of our regular uh, congregation or you're someone from the community who's thinking about visiting us in the near future, uh, we're just requesting that you head over to our website and on the very front page you'll see a link to, for a survey. And this is just us trying to gauge uh, some feedback about how people are feeling about coming back to church and what they're expecting. So it's going to help us plan and prepare to make the, it the best experience for you when we do start meeting in person again. Let me close us with a benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine toward you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Thank you for coming. And we'll see you back here Wednesday night, 6 p.m. for another Worship and Song evening.